Welcome to Codex, a history of video games. My name is Tyler Osby. And I'm Mike Coletta. And this week, we are going to be discussing the Xbox 360. We're starting to get into a little bit more of the modern era of video games. At least I consider the Xbox 360 to be modern. It's nearly 15 years old now, so there is a point where it becomes classic, right? What were you doing in 2003? In 2003? Yeah, no, you know. 2004. No, it's, it's 2005. Well, our story so, begins in 2003. Though. Oh, our story, our story begins in 2003. Mm-hmm. That's when I Batman was, was sitting on the rooftop of the Redmond building in Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> in 2003, I was going to Desert Hills Middle School. I was 13 Ooh. years old. Nice. I was just entering high school. Big day. Big days. All right. Yeah. All right. But you know what was going on at Microsoft in February 2003 is they began work on the next generation of console follow-up to the original xbox so they had some fun code names this this podcast loves code names it's very important we mention that and i will always mention a code name and we actually have some really fun ones so other code names for the new xbox console before we got to xbox 360 was xbox next xenon xbox Ooh. 2 xbox fs have no idea idea what fs stands for no clue and then my personal favorite, Next Box. <laughs> That's pretty good. I kind of wish they'd gone with Next Box. I do too. And then they have to be like the After Box for the third one. I don't know. It'd be fun though. It'd be real fun. <laughs> Jay Allard, I think that's how you say that, or Allard, he was the VP at Microsoft who was selected to take on the lead on the new systems Xenon software program. And it was the Xenon software program or platform, sorry, because it used the Xenon chip, which was made by IBM. We'll get to that in a bit. But another big move at Microsoft during this time is former Sega president Peter Moore, who you may remember as being Mr. Dreamcast, as I like Mm -hmm. to call him. Uh, He was hired on January 20th, 2003, so right before they got started. And he actually still loves it. This is kind of cool. I found a little tidbit about him. He loves it when people come up to him and say they really like the Dreamcast. He's like, oh, thank you. That means the world to me. That makes me happy. So (laughs) when he was at Microsoft, he gained some notoriety uh, because he displayed tattoos of Halo 2 and Grand Theft Auto 4. When he was announcing the games, he had tattoos made. And there's this rumor going around that the halo 2 tattoo wasn't real and some people are like fighting over whether it was permanent or like a stick on and no one oh, believes man. it or not so there's some real drama i hope there. it's real i hope so too Maybe i want it just, to be real i want it to be real too I, I don't know what it is either i never looked at the image of what it was i should have looked it up but the best part about this guy too is this is how he marketed xbox like one of the ways he marketed the 360 is he's like you know what if you're gonna get another console other than the xbox 360 you should get a Wii. He's like, it's cheaper. And the price of the PlayStation 3, it's just too expensive. Like that's because he knew he was competing with PlayStation more than the Nintendo Wii. And that's mm-hmm. how he decided to do it. So I thought that was kind of cool. That is cool. And plus, if you bought an Xbox and a Wii, you definitely weren't about to be buying a PlayStation 3 too, unless you are me. <laughs> that's true. Unless you're Tyler, <laughs> who's really into all three. So to help bring in like the brand new console, to make it come to life they also sign an agreement with the graphics card manufacturer ati on august 12 2003 so they're on board ibm as i said before made the xenon processor which is used in the xbox 360 uh sony also used xenon processors not necessarily in the playstation but in other items they manufactured Mm. so ibm employees actually had to hide their work from sony while working on this project for Microsoft. Because Sony wow. knew Microsoft had something brewing with the Xenon. So they're like, hey, let's just tell us what it is. And they're like, no, man, no, get away from me. Leave me alone. <laughs> I'm my own independent person. So in February 2003, Microsoft held an event for 400 developers in Bellevue, Washington to recruit support for the new next box, as I'm going to call it now until it's actually released in our timeline here. And if you don't know, <laughs> Bellevue is essentially microsoft's city they are out of redmond that's where their big campus is and i'm about 40 minutes from bellevue but if you look at the skyline in bellevue it's all microsoft it says microsoft on like all the big buildings if there's a big building over 10 stories high in bellevue it probably says microsoft on it so i just wanted to give some people context so their big campus is in redmond which is about 10 minutes away from bellevue but microsoft very much big into bellevue big town okay also bellevue has a really nice christmas parade they do every year just 
I actually work on the tourism board for Bellevue, Washington. Did you know that, Tyler? <laughs> Secrets. Oh, no, Secrets. I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah. This just, episode is sponsored by... Just promoting your other, your other gig. Bellevue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. No big deal. <laughs> actually, uh, JBCS oh. will take place in Bellevue. So just want everyone to know that. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. JBCS. Uh, yeah. Also important to note that the early alpha dev kits for Xbox 360 ran on an Apple Power Mac G5. Because Power Mac's processor was similar to Xenon's, and so that's how they could like emulate it before they had the Xenon stuff ready, which I thought was kind of I remember, an interesting tidbit. I remember there being a thing at uh, like an E3 or something where they were showing the Xbox 360, and you could see kind of behind the curtain the like Power Macs they had piled up back there to like run the demos on. They were the old, uh, affectionately known as the Cheese Grater Power Mac, because uh, it looks like a cheese grater. Um, yeah, it was just funny because it was like, this is a Microsoft thing. We're showing you Microsoft games on this Apple computer. That's not weird. That's not weird at all. That's nope. kind of, I mean, I think, that, I think it's funny though. So <laughs> let's go to launch day. At launch day, it was released on November 22nd, 2005 in the United States and Canada. Then launched on December 2nd, 2005 in Europe. Then December 10th, 2005, eight days later in Japan. After this, it was then launched in Mexico, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, India, and Russia. And you're wow. like, hey, Mike, that's a lot of countries. Well, guess what? Are you what? an animaniac? Or are you just like pointing at the I'm map just pointing as you at do the map right now, yeah. And Colombia, Mexico, Hong Brazil, Kong, Chile, <laughs> Colombia, Hong Kong, Singapore, and South Korea. Okay, that's really you did tough. a way better impression of me, though. <laughs> that was really good, Tyler. So the system launched in 36 countries in total, which is more countries at that time than any other console has launched in a single year. Pretty impressive, if you ask me. So I want to mention, though, to spotlight, sales in Japan specifically were a little rough. And I don't know if we talked about this on the Xbox episode. Microsoft has always had a hard time selling Xboxes in Japan. It did very poorly for the original Xbox. And for the Xbox 360, it did very poorly. And the numbers for sales were 450,000. And you're like, man, that doesn't sound that bad. Well, those were the sales from December 5th, 2005, all the way to 2011. <laughs> Whoa. So in six years, they only sold 450,000 consoles. That's really bad for a major AAA video game console, I guess you could say, in a country. So yeah, really hmm. rough there. Sales were rough in America at the start because they started production of the Xbox 360 69 days before the North American release. That's so Is that soon. enough time? Not Seems enough like time. Maybe not they enough sold time. out completely, except in Japan. <laughs> I should mention, they did not sell out in Japan. In fact, they should have just taken those Japanese Xboxes and moved them over to the United States, if you ask me. But <laughs> by the end of 2005, though, they did manage to sell around 900,000 Xbox 360s. So they got it together for the holidays, but they definitely were having some troubles, you know, with, uh, with their release. Uh, the, it uh, launched uh, initially with two different options. You could get the Xbox 360 Premium model for $399 US or the Core version, which sold for $299 US. And the Premium came with a 20 gigabyte hard drive. Whoa, huge at the time. Whoa, huge. A wireless controller and component hookups for HD video. But if you opted for the cheaper bundle, you got no hard drive. Oh, man. Sad. Bummer no hard drive, a wired controller, and only composite cables for standard def. So those like uh, the old yellow, red, and white, right? Mm -hmm. Is that those ones? Yeah. That's so those ones. The drive tray of the CD drive also had plastic instead of chrome, which forever made you know that you got the cheaper one. Like, oh man, I don't have any chrome on mine. That's sad. Yeah. But it didn't you matter. shiny. You goofed. <laughs> Yeah, it didn't matter because eventually you'd probably have to get a new Xbox because sales were fine. But we now have to talk about the most important event surrounding the Xbox 360 and something I've been looking forward to talking about on this podcast for 39 episodes prior. And that is the <laughs> notorious Red Ring of Death. If you turned on your Xbox, say, say Tyler, you're waking up. It's 2000. Five. You just got an Xbox 360 under the Christmas tree. Oh, we're in pair. I don't know if that happened to you. Did that happen to you, Tyler? No, it didn't. Okay, so this is Bizarro World, Tyler, and you're in an alternate <laughs> dimension, and you got an Xbox 360, and you're like, oh man, I can't wait to play Fusion Frenzy or whatever. And then you open. I can't wait to play this 
original Xbox game on my 360. Yeah. yeah. Like, that, again, it came out actually in Bizarro World. It came out. Oh, for right, this. right, right. Yeah. Okay. We're in Bizarro World. This is yeah. an alternate history we're creating. So everyone's uh-huh. got to just deal with it right now. And <laughs> Tyler, you, you turn on your Xbox 360 and oh no, three red lights come on in like a like three quarters circle around your Xbox. That could my mean my brand new Xbox 360. Your brand new Xbox 360 oh. that you just got at Christmas. It's because you've been playing it nonstop for a week, and that could mean two things. One, your power brick is not plugged in all the way. Very easy mistake to make. You just unplug everything, replug it back together. It's fine. Oh, crisis averted. We'll say for your story in Bizarro World, that's what happened to you, Tyler. Because I don't want to ruin your childhood in Thank an alternate goodness. dimension. Now, thank you so much, Mike. Your Xbox also could have suffered a, quote, general hardware failure. And now you must go on YouTube and try every dumb fix in the book. And we'll get to those in a bit. But the general hardware failure was due, in theory, I should say, because Microsoft has never released any official statement on this for a couple of reasons. First, from Electronics Industry Newspaper, or EE Times, they claimed that when Microsoft was designing the chip they did it in-house to cut costs instead of going through an asic vendor which i have no idea what that acronym means but it sounds important so they saved money by skipping over this vendor and in the process they screwed up somehow and the chip the gpu would not be able to dissipate heat Mm. and that's why you got the red ring of death that's one theory a second theory, and this came from a computer, a German computer magazine called C apostrophe T. It's like it's a like cut. I don't know how you say it, but anyway, I don't know. Um, it blamed the problem primarily on a solder that they used that was lead free that had a tendency to get brittle and break when it had high temperatures for long periods of time. And it would actually make these like hairline cracks in the solder that was irreparable. And so they actually think like that's the theory that sounds the best to me, especially when it comes to trying to fix this and what you have to do. So, yeah, I think this one makes the most sense to me, too. Yeah. And so the article also revealed that um, representatives of three large Xbox 360 resellers, which were EB Games, GameStop and Best Buy, claimed that the failure rate on the Xbox 360 was between 30 percent and 33%, which is a Whoa, lot. That's I mean, nuts. that's 300,000 out of the 900,000 consoles they sold initially in that first wow. month. So, yeah, it's it's pretty crazy. Like, they just, I mean, you could go get it repaired at like some side people too. Like, there's people that repair it. But what would end up happening is you'd have to send it back to Microsoft. And we'll get to that in a second. But there's also another theory that came out that claimed that the connect maybe had an issue with the old Xenon processors, but that was never proven by any media outlet. It was just like speculation I found and I couldn't find anything backing that up. So we're going to say this stuff was, I feel like this stuff was happening before the connect came out too. Yeah, definitely. This was, this was a really an early Xbox problem. This was a hundred percent. If you got that console new. So I don't know where that came from because the connect came out like a little bit later. We'll talk about the connect later, but yeah. So I'm going to say the official, Codex history of video games standard is that brittle defective solder that that German yeah. company revealed. So it makes the most sense, especially when you consider the ways people were going about fixing it and like how you could sort of fix it and how it wasn't ever really a permanent fix, but it would work good enough for a while. Yeah. And I don't, total sense. I a hundred percent don't doubt that it's like also maybe it has to do with the cheap in-house graphic card stuff they built. I don't, I don't doubt yeah. that, but the solder seems to be the most prominent theory. So these are the two silly fixes. Well, one's silly and one's actually the real fix that I found. Okay. And the first one I know of, because my brother 100% did this, but his Xbox 360 was illegally modded. So in the long run, it didn't do anything. It bricked out eventually. Um, (laughs) So the first is you would take, we're back in bizarro world, but it's a different mm-hmm. universe, Tyler. Okay, and so we're now we're ex- on Earth. We're on Earth six ninety eight. Yeah, Earth six ninety eight. And in this okay. one, you did get a broken three sixty. Oh, you, yeah. Dang you, know, it. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say, when you were a kid, you had a pet monkey. Again, bizarre world that you didn't know. This is an alternate yeah. universe, and the monkey turned on your three sixty and walked away for like twelve straight hours, and the heat wow. got to a problem, and it broke it. Yeah, so, super rude. 
Yeah, you should blame Mr. Bananas because that's who did it. That was the name of your monkey in this bizarre world too. I'm just making Mr. up stuff. Bananas, <laughs> bananas. So, um, anyway, your pet monkey broke your Xbox 360. Now, Tyler, you, as yourself, go online. You find this out. You then decide, okay, I found this video. We're gonna try this out. You disassemble your Xbox 360, which already breaks the warranty, so you're kind of in trouble. <laughs> you then take out the motherboard, mm-hmm. put it on a baking sheet. And make a little Microsoft Snickerdoodle is what we like to call it, where you put. Oh, it sounds tasty. You put the you put the, the motherboard <laughs> into the oven, and you actually bake your motherboard, hoping it melts the solder back into place. And this is a temporary solution, one hundred percent. Does it work? Yes, it worked for my brother for about a week, and then his Xbox red ringed again. So I will say yep. this works, but it's definitely like, oh my gosh, I got to get my save files out or whatever. I don't know. So that's what you got to do. The real I definitely did that with my PlayStation 3, which had a the yellow light of death error, which is a similar error for similar reasons. I definitely did that and got about six more months out of that PlayStation 3. I actually should try it again sometime when I go home and just see if I can get it working again. Oh, is it still broken there? You still got it broken there? Yeah, I still got a broken PS3 at my parents' house. Well, you know what? We're going to say right now then that as far as the... Um baking motherboard trick goes sony wins the motherboard baking competition <laughs> over <Yeah>. microsoft you heard it <laughs> first baking here, contest folks yeah the great british motherboard baking show <laughs> sony won <laughs> uh, so the second solution and this is the real solution is you need to do two things you need to resolder areas of the board that you suspect are overheated. And there were a lot of guides online that would be like, okay, this is where it usually goes. So just do it here, do it here, do it here, do it here. And then the other one was replacing the thermal paste on the Xbox 360. And that seems dicey because you're actually taking apart the stuff on there, you know? But the one you, of the. You should be doing that when you cook it in the oven too at least that's what i did um because all the stuff you have to remove you don't want to actually cook in the oven so you should be replacing that anyway that probably has an effect on making it not happen again in the future if you can redo the thermal paste properly like if you just get better heat dissipation you might not run into the same issue again but um i don't think just replacing if it's already broken just replacing the thermal paste isn't gonna fix it dude totally that's totally it that's good that's good note tyler I'm actually, I didn't know that you did that. I'm glad it worked yeah. for you. That's really cool that it worked for you. For six months, I should say. Did you have to get a new PS3 or did you never get a new PS3? I did eventually get a new PS3, yeah. I actually, my original Xbox, and this is before they had auto shutoff functions for if you turned it on too long. And I'm actually going to blame my cat. I went on vacation with my whole family. And when I came home, my Xbox original was bricked. And I swear I didn't leave it on, and I really think my cat turned it on or something. hundred <laughs> percent. Mr. Mittens. Oh, her name was Slinky. Slinky. You know? Okay. Although, according to our theme, if it's Mr. Bananas is the name of the monkey, then it should be like Mrs. Tuna for my kitty cat or something. <laughs> it should just be what in this the, in Earth six ninety eight. All pets are Mr. or Mrs. Whatever they whatever eat. Whatever they eat. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Every horse is named Mr. Hay, and it's really confusing. <laughs> <laughs> But okay, so now those are the fixes for the Red Ring of Death. But that's not the only hardware error that you'd encounter with an Xbox 360. And I was actually, I thought the full Red Ring was bad. But the full Red Ring actually just means your AV cords are not plugged in correctly. And you need to redo it. Oh, easy. Yeah, fun fact. If you always use an HDMI cord, you would never get the full red ring. I found that out online Hmm. because the HDMI cord did not go associated with that error code. So Hmm. uh, the other common issue with the Xbox 360, and this is pretty actually important because I noticed it actually on my CDs in my games, is it could scratch your games or your movies or your CDs. There was a lawsuit about this, I think, too. I don't remember how it turned out, though. Yeah, so what it would do is it would cause circular scratches like all on the disc where it was spinning. Like you'd see just a line going in a circle on it. They use a very fancy word in the article I read, and I didn't write it down because I don't want to pretend I'm smarter than I actually am. So uh, <laughs> it, it would burn these scratches in your disc while it was spinning, and it was caused most of the time when you had a disc in there and you had to move it. 
like say you were a kid that had a short attention span like me yours truly and you were like i can't decide if i want to lay my xbox 360 flat or vertically because it could go both ways you know it could stand in two ways you should just change it all the time while you're playing games yeah you should just change it all the time while you're playing that seems to make sense and if you did that it would definitely scratch your disc but it could still scratch your disc even if you played it all the time and you didn't move it it was just a thing that it was not secure enough in the drive when it was in there that it wouldn't scratch it. It was a problem with the Xbox 360 in the end. It really was. So Real bummer. Yeah, real bummer. But actually, Tyler, I want you to talk about this part because you found a really good article on this about what Microsoft did about the Red Ring of Death. Oh, yeah. So what Microsoft did about the the uh, Red Ring of Death here is when they figured it out, when they had the, all the data they needed to make the the conclusion that, yes, there's something going on here. It's not just like weird. It's not just like a few isolated cases where it's just acceptable. There's a failure rate. You just fix them, whatever. Right. But once they figured out that, hey, we got a real issue here. This is going to this is going to cost us some some real money, some real Skrilla. Peter Moore. Um, who was the an executive over at Xbox that we talked about earlier, the, the Dreamcast guy. He figured it all out. He got all his data together, and he went to uh, then-CEO of Microsoft, Steve Ballmer, and he said, look, and I'm, I'm going to find the quote here, exactly what, what he said. He said, uh, this is what he said in an interview to, to somebody else, said, um, I'm trembling stat, sat in front of Steve, who I love to death, but he can be an intimidating human being. Steve said, okay, talk me through this. I said, if we don't do this, this brand is dead. Steve looked at me and said, well, what do we got to do? I said, we got to take them all back. We got to do this in a first class way, because when you take a console away from a gamer, you're going to be spending three weeks fixing it. So we've got to FedEx this all the way. We've got to FedEx this all the way. We've got to overnight it back in two. So um, then Steve Ballmer asked, what's it going to cost? And I remember taking a deep breath, looking at Robbie, Robbie Bach, I think is the person he's talking about there. Anyway, I remember taking a deep breath, looking at Robbie and saying, we think it's 1.15 billion, Steve. And he said, do it. There was no hesitation. See, so, and I love that because they realized they made a mistake and they fixed it. Yep. That they makes me they super realized happy. that this was their goof and they had to. And it also didn't hurt that when Peter was like, hey, if we don't do this, Xbox is over. So the decision then becomes like, if Steve Ballmer wants to make the decision like, well, is Xbox over? No. All right. Guess we better do it. And so they did it. And so they would like, if you, they extended the warranty on the original Xbox 360 um, to three years from whatever your purchase date was. Um, and then they would fix it for free if you, if it got red ranked within like three years. Uh, some consoles didn't, a lot did. Um, and there were a lot of like aftermarket places that would fix it for real cheap. But I remember what they would do is they would send you a box, like a coffin for your Xbox. <laughs> and you would like do a, you would have to do some kind of like a ceremony, you know, and like lower it Light into the ground. Light some candles, up. say some Light final some words. Light some candles. Put your Xbox in the coffin, pack it up, send it back to Microsoft where they would keep it for like three weeks and then they'd send it back to you. I think, I don't know if they were actually fixing them or if they were refurbishing them and like sending, you didn't always get your Xbox back. So you had to do some stuff like to make sure your Xbox Live stuff um, transferred over okay. But um they would uh, send you a new Xbox back in a few weeks, and they did it completely free. That's why they sent you the box, so they didn't make you pay to ship it. They didn't ship pay, make you pay to ship it back. They just fixed it. And it could still red ring again because they weren't really fixing them. They were just refurbishing them, but um, you could always just send it back. So, Yeah, that's, pretty cool. that's so good, man. That's like a yeah. company, again, and it's not... I don't want to say that corporations and capitalism is good because we all know that's not true, but it makes me really happy <laughs> when I see companies treating their customers well like this like hey we messed up let's fix it and we're gonna pay yeah. the price for it because yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's the right choice from a capitalist perspective too i think if you think the brand is going to take that big of a hit and you're no longer going to be able to make money off of this brand it makes spending a billion dollars seem pretty easy even if it was your fault and preventable yeah. like you gotta I mean, do it right we can only speculate but i don't think he's wrong like we put out a product and one third of them was bad <laughs> yep we wouldn't yeah, survive. That's terrible. That. And it's like it's like several hundred dollar product too. It's like this is not a just a like ah crap, just buy another one, right? It's like this is a big deal. If your thing broke, you had to spend yeah. a lot of money to replace it if they wouldn't fix it. It's not like your Wi Fi dongle is broken. It's like your right. full on thing is broken. Right. Your full game system. So that's I, really I, good. I, I don't remember if they did this. Something in my brain is telling me they did this, so maybe I'm completely wrong, but I think they also had an option where they would take a credit card from you and they would put like a hold of like $300 on it and then they would send you a new one right away and then you just ship the old one back and then once they got the old one, they'd like take the hold off your credit card. 
Um, so you That's could get awesome. it even faster if you were willing to put up 300 bucks just to say, you know, just to make sure that they're not just sending you free Xboxes. And I bet you they could do that too, where they would just like get yours in the mail, refurbish it, and then send it to someone else. Like they just do yeah. that back and forth. And that's because you got to think initially when they started this program, they had some Xbox, at least parts, like at least motherboards handy, like good motherboards. Mm-hmm. So they got, yeah, they got plenty of Xboxes lying around. And they probably diverted some stock so that they would have brand new ones. And then, yeah, it later revisions of the the motherboard, uh, even even on the, the fat xbox 360 there were later revisions that were much less likely to fail i know yeah Um, i know one of them is they moved the hard drive and oh really yeah they moved the hard drive to the bottom of the case and that completely kind of redesigned how everything was spaced out and it helped in some way i don't know what it did exactly that was just one of the big changes they made Hmm. in the later models which we're going to get to later because boy were there a lot of variations of the xbox (laughs) 360 yeah um yeah i I, yeah, there's a lot of Xboxes. I actually was wondering, because I have an Xbox 360. It's actually sitting right next to me. It still works. The only Same. thing that broke with it is the um, the USB door to ent- ex- get a- into the USB oh, yeah. ports. That fell down, and it won't come back up. It, like The spring-loaded thing broke. But other than that, still a great console. And I'm going to talk about which one it is did later. It, did it ever Red Ring? Nope, never Red Ring. It Red Ring oh. one time because I had the cords plugged in incorrectly. Oh, well, so that was, I got you know mine... What? I got mine in like September of 2007. I got it because I was super excited for Rock Band. Um, oh, yeah, man. And it probably red ringed in like spring of 2010, I want to say. So it was like almost three years and it red ringed and I had to send it back. It's been fine ever since. Yeah, I mean, it's it's surprising. Mine still runs really well and I'm kind of weirdly attached to it. Like it's sitting in the same box I bought it in. <laughs> it's like it's sitting in the box. The box lid has since torn off, obviously, but it's just mm-hmm. hanging out in there. And I have so many controllers for some reason. I don't know what I should do. I should do something with it. But <laughs> help I figured, me, help me with these controllers. Yeah, you guys, think, you guys don't know. I can see Mike right now, and his room is just full of Xbox 360 controllers. I'm actually They're falling like, off the ceiling. They're swinging around on the fan by the cord. Yeah. It's really bad. It's just Xbox controllers, and it's like play and plug, plug and play kits just everywhere, like tangled yeah. up in balls, and I'm just falling away through them. It's it's like tentacles just attacking yeah. me and grabbing it's scary it's scary in here but okay <laughs> <laughs> we should say that this warranty only applied to those launch consoles it did not apply to the it stopped when they got to the xbox 360 s that was the first oh, brand yeah. that when didn't they redesigned have, it completely yeah so i shouldn't say launch consoles because yeah. there were some variations that came out afterward but when they got to the s model of xbox 360 which is the slim is what that mm-hmm. stands for that model did no longer had a three-year warranty it just went back down to the two-year warranty so now uh and we're gonna talk about this we're gonna talk about the controller and the xbox 360 controller might still be my favorite controller how do you feel about that tyler um i i really like the xbox 360 controller uh i think i like the xbox one controller a little bit more um, but it definitely was an upgrade from the, the Xbox, the original Xbox. Um, it was an upgrade from the S, but it was especially an upgrade from the Duke. Holy moly. Oh, that man, Duke controller Duke. was truly awful. Um, but it was, yeah, I like it. And I liked how it was the first um, console controller that was very easy to use on a PC as well. Um, you just which, plug it in, right? You just plug it in, yeah. If you had if you had Windows Vista or higher, it just worked right out of the box. If you had... Um, like Windows XP, you had to download some drivers. I don't know if it worked immediately on release on Windows XP, but it uh, it, it was just a standard USB plug, um, which no other console had had up till that point. Even the original Xbox used it used U- standard USB for its controllers, but the connector was different, which made it you just couldn't use it on a PC unless you wanted to do some wire soldering, which I did. And then even then, you still had to download drivers and stuff because it wasn't made for a PC. But yeah, I really liked it. Big fan. Um, I remember Crisis had built-in support for it, which I w- blew my mind when I, I didn't have to set up the buttons for a controller on a PC game. I was like, it just works? What? You're like, how Crazy. is this happening? <laughs> yeah. How does it know? So I got to say, too, the thing about it that I think I loved so much is it just felt better in your hand. Like, they got it right with the Xbox original S controller, the one after the Duke, but then they made it even more comfy to hold. And I guess you could mm-hmm. probably say the Xbox One is even more comfy to hold than the 360 controller. They have improved on every controller they've put out, for sure. Yeah, I agree. I, I think they've, they've just gotten better and better. The, the yeah. Xbox One controller is mm, perfection. I do love uh, the PlayStation controller as well, but I think the Xbox controller just narrowly beats it. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I'm obviously biased because I've been an, an Xbox person for a long time, but I, I do. The DualShock is a great controller. Uh, you want to talk about those black and white buttons and what they did with those? Because those were on the original Xbox, but they were not on the 360, right? Oh, yeah. So the original Xbox had like A, B, X, and Y. And then it also had these black and white buttons, which were just, they were just referred to as black and white. And they were, in on the Duke, they were like kind of above the other buttons. And on the controller S, they were kind of below the other buttons. But they were never really in a spot that made them like really useful or like that made a whole lot of sense. But on the 360, they removed those completely and they replaced them with two extra shoulder buttons, uh, affectionately known as right bumper and left bumper. And um, they... That was like the way to go because it also gave them sort of uh, an analog to like the PlayStation controllers, which had L1 and R1 and L2 and R2. Um, So that made it easier for developers to like port games in between too because they didn't have to figure out what to do with those buttons. The only thing I remember the black and white buttons doing is I think in Halo, it would turn on your flashlight and the other one would change grenades, but I don't remember which one did what. (laughs) <laughs> that's I think all I remember. white turned on the flashlight and black turned on grenades or switched grenades. That's the best. It's the best. I'm that we guessing remember completely. Those it's a 50 50 shot. So. Well, I mean, white, like a yeah, flashlight, a, like light, yeah, sure. I guess. That, I don't know. I, maybe that's it. I don't know. And it was also kind of like a translucent button, if I remember. The, the, black, the black and white buttons were like translucent kind of a little bit. Maybe I'm messing that up. I don't know. I'm speculating. Yeah. History podcast, no speculation. Okay, now we're going to talk <laughs> about the Connect which was first announced on June 1st, 2009 at the Electronic Entertainment Expo under the code name, here's another code name, Project Natal or Natal. Is it Natal Project or Natal? Natal. I remember Natal? this. Yeah, this yeah, is... I remember that announcement. That was very interesting. Yeah, the Connect is pretty crazy technology when you think about it. It's like mm-hmm. you just stand in front of it and it sees your whole body and it senses all your movement. Yeah, it actually Great uses dance games. similar technology to the the iPhone 10 that has like the facial recognition stuff. It uses some of that kind of same sort of technology. It had two cameras, if I'm recall, recalling correctly, it had two cameras on the front, so it could kind of see in in stereo like 3D. But then it also had a um, infrared dot projector that if you you wouldn't see it because it was infrared, but if you like looked through the camera lens or if you had like a camera that would show you infrared, it projected dots all over your room, like just like little tiny dots everywhere. And using the way those reflected back into the camera was how it would know depth, and so how it would be able to tell people apart or like know like if you're moving your hands around or stuff. It was really really wild technology that was that was pretty cool. It ended up not really having a ton of practical use if i recall can we but, just yeah have a moment here for a second to say how happy i am that you're my co-host on this show because i had <laughs> no idea how to explain the connect and in our notes i just wrote explain the connect and then tyler did an amazing explanation of it because <laughs> i was like i mean it's a thing that you stand in front of and it sees your movements and then you just explained what it does <laughs> Yeah, it's. It, I mean, it's pretty cool technology, and it is used in the iPhone 10 for for facial recognition. Similar technology, like the three, the dot projector for reading your face, and like that, all that kind of stuff is. Yeah, is I will neat. say. I mean, I know there was a game called Connectables, which is my favorite, mm-hmm. and I just sticks to me because of the name is so fun. But then there were a lot of dance games that you would use the Connect for, like Just Dance or something like that. You know, I think there was Connect Sports too, which is like definitely Wii not Wii Sports. <laughs> <laughs> it was released, by the way. It came out on November 4th, 2010. And I think this was Microsoft's response to the Wii's motion controls and the PlayStation Move, which was mm-hmm. their motion Both controls. Both of which were, were better. I think Microsoft is a cooler idea. Like, the potential is way cooler. But it just ended up not working out as well as they wanted it to. And the Wii and the PlayStation 3's motion stuff actually ended up having a little bit of practical application, I think. Yeah, definitely. And I think it was, I mean, it was a cool idea. And as you can see with the Connect on Xbox One, all it does is turn on when you're trying to talk about something else because it's annoying. Yeah. So they, yeah. it was required for the Xbox One. They were going, they went all in on Connect for a few years there. And then once they realized that nobody wanted it, they like stopped making it a requirement and they stopped yeah, shipping it with Xbox Connect One. My Connect has been in the travel case for my Xbox One I bought when I started doing road comedy and taking my Xbox with me because that's what I need to do to survive. Uh, <laughs> and I have not taken it out of the little case thing and plugged because I'm just like, it creeps me out kind of too. Yeah. Like, I don't like having a camera looking at me. It's weird. I know, and I can see you in the dark too because of those infrared Really dots. creepy. Yeah, it's like yeah. the predator. It's like you have the yep. predator living in your Xbox. No one likes that. Okay, 
But now we're going to talk about the thing that is, this is what makes the Xbox 360 so great. And this is what changed everything. And that is the revamping of Xbox Live. Which this was is, already pretty sweet. Yeah, it was pretty sweet with the original Xbox, but this is when it just blew everything out of the water as far as online gaming goes. I don't like, and this might be a lot to say because I'm talking up with a system that I fell in love with, but I don't think online console gaming would be where it is right now if it wasn't for the Xbox 360 and Xbox Live. Like that's no, absolutely not. This is what made everything. This is what started. Like we wouldn't have Fortnite on consoles if it wasn't for Xbox Live being there to mm-hmm. be like, this is how you do it. You have party chat. You have messenger. You have a friends list. You have the big one, which is achievements. Mm-hmm. Like these things in the game that made it so you keep playing the same game to get these achievements, to chase it and you compare it with your friends and then you have gamer scores. It's just everything about it is amazing. I, what I think I like the most about Xbox live just in, in general is the way it unites all of the games on a platform. You have the same online username in whatever game you play, um, which means your reputation can kind of travel with you through games back in the day before the times of Xbox live, even on console, if you got a game that went online you made a, an account, username, password for that game, and you were that's like what you needed for that game. And like, if you wanted to play a different game, you'd have to use a whole new account or maybe a whole new name, unless you were playing like EA games, which they kind of had like their own, like different publishers sort of had their own system so that you could kind of, um, but there weren't that many online games. So there's that bit of keeping your identity together. And then achievements, like you were saying earlier, as a way of comparing people um, who don't even play the same games. You can kind of look at your score compared to someone else's score, even if you play none of the same games, and you can kind of get a sense for how like good they are at games or how hardcore they are at games because of this um, this like scoring system that happens on a meta level above the games themselves, which I think is really cool. And uh, it took a long time for the rest of the gaming play the gaming circle to catch up to. I know the PlayStation Three didn't have trophies until a couple years after it came out, which itself was a year after the Xbox 360 and Nintendo still doesn't have any of that, which you could argue that um, philosophically Nintendo probably shouldn't have achievements, but well, um, they just had the news too this week that Xbox live is coming to Nintendo switch. What? Oh, you, I didn't even see that. You didn't hear about this. Xbox no. live will be a multi-platform online service starting soon. It will be on Android, iOS and Nintendo switch. Oh, wow. Yeah, there, it's I'm, pretty crazy. I don't think it's going to be like crossplay, but it's going to be like, hey, I'm playing uh, Diablo on my Switch and I see my buddies on Xbox Live. Maybe I should message him and just see if he wants to play another game or something like that on yeah. Switch together. Like, I don't think it's like multi. It's not like cross progression or cross saves, obviously, but you're going to see your friends and you're going to have Messenger and you're going to see Gamer Score. Now, if Gamer Score came to Switch... That would be pretty hmm. crazy. If they had achievements for Nintendo games, that would be really yeah. cool. But yeah, that to, was just announced this that. week. Yeah, it was brand new news, like probably want to say three or four days ago. Oh, okay. So, Dang, dude. Yeah, it's kind of great. Kind of big news. My, my one thing, too, about Xbox Live, and I say my one thing, and I've had like eight things so far, is that this is what kind of made people be like, I'm an Xbox guy or I'm a PlayStation guy is like, you get this community going. Like I've had the same gamer tag for since I guess 2008 is when I got my 360, and Mm -hmm. I have refused to change it. Like I can't change it. I, I it's like stuck. It's like a part of like that gamer tag is so dumb, but it's what I love and I'm not going to ever change it. And it's me, you know, it's like Mm -hmm. that kind of, you get attached to something like that, which I think is what they did. That's really good. Really cool. Yeah. And it's a good way to keep people, like you said, sort of locked into a platform, too, if they feel like they have a community there, if they feel like they, they want to buy games on Xbox because they want to get the achievements. They don't care about their PlayStation trophies. Like, they want achievements. Like, that's a good way to lock people in, too, if you're, if you're Microsoft. Mm-hmm. So When I was playing Destiny good. on Xbox, or as I like to call it, the dark times, uh, <laughs> before Tyler was the light in my life, you know, I would play with randos on Xbox One, And even though we were randos, they'd always add me as a friend. Then they'd come back. And like, that's kind of how I built this really little community that we would play Destiny together before I had you to play with on PC and stuff. Before I abandoned all of them is what I'm saying. (laughs) (laughs) Yikes. But like, that's, it was kind it was really nice just to have that. Like we all had Xbox, we all had Destiny and these are the people that I would play with. And it was really fun. Um, Another thing that Xbox Live did is they came out with Xbox Live Arcade. 
Oh yeah. Which huge. gave you these like 10 to $15 games that would come out. And I know an examples of these would be like Hasbro board games that you could download like Xbox 360 versions of them, like Uno or Monopoly and stuff like that. But they also had like Tetris. Geometry Wars. Geometry Wars is a really big one. This is when the indies started coming on yeah. Xbox Live. This is kind of what made indie gaming come to console was this. If yeah. Without that, I we re- wouldn't have really amazing indie games on Xbox. I remember when Braid came out and that was like, that was an indie game that probably wouldn't have sold very well in the store or at least would have had trouble finding a publisher to publish it in a store, like with physical copies. But because it was so cheap and because it like, it was easily available on the store for download, um, which was the first time consoles had had like, where like mainstream consoles had had like a downloadable, um, like downloading whole games um, to oh, yeah, like that an was internal that storage. Too having like downloadable con like games you could just choose to download them instead of buying the disc it came yeah, in the xbox that was 360 later. that would come that came like a couple of years later like the downloading of like oh i would rather download gears of war than buy it at the store but when the xbox live arcade first came out it was still like i can play a game without putting a disc in oh my gosh this is blowing my mind um, i think the which first time sweet. i took advantage of this was actually well, I guess there's Minecraft, but there was also those Trials games, the motorcycle ones. Oh, yeah. yeah Trials yeah. was an Xbox Live Arcade title that was so fun. Just so much fun playing those games. It's so simple, too. It's so mm-hmm. great. Uh, also, um, one more thing about this is also, I think, a reason why hard drives got bigger. So in its lifetime, the Xbox 360 had hard drives ranging from 20 gigs, which came out with the premium model Xbox 360. And then it ended with them being up to 320 gigs. Jeez. And you needed that space to download these games, to download yeah. and play these arcade games. So they kind of... Xbox had too many games. It had too many games. It's, that's why it was so <laughs> successful. But yeah, it's Xbox Live completely changed everything. And also another, another ding on PlayStation's record would be the fact that Xbox Live, when you bought the console, it always came with a headset. Yeah. And then where I know for PlayStation for the longest time, you had to go buy a separate Bluetooth headset and use that. Yep. Like one for like a mobile phone, not to just sit here and poo poo on PlayStation because PlayStation's great in so many other ways, obviously, but, um, exclusives, for example, sorry, mm-hmm. Microsoft, you really, you really letting dropping the ball on that front. But I just think this is, th- this is what makes people remember the 360 is an amazing console is Xbox live. Yes, that uh, that's a fact. And it really pushed forward online gaming in lots of different ways. Yeah. So now um, I was going to go through real quick, Tyler, and mention some of the variations of consoles. And I'm skipping like the Halo editions because the Halo or whatever editions or whatever sure. game you're thinking of, they're the same as these. They just had different like color schemes, essentially. Mm-hmm. So in November 22nd, 2005, we had the premium, as I said, with 20 gigabyte hard drive for 400 bucks and then the 360 core for 300 bucks. The next edition was the Xbox 360 Elite. Ooh, that one on, came in black. Yeah, on April 29th, 2007, and it had a 120 gigabyte hard drive, and that was 479.99. Never going to fill that up. Holy Never, man. yeah. That was so much. So, and then in October 2000 uh, October 27th, 2007, was the Xbox 360 Arcade Edition. And this had a very, I want to say it was a six gig hard drive. It was I very. I think at first they had no hard drive and I think they came with a memory card. Oh, later yeah. on, they had four gig like hard drives, just like barely enough. Because later versions of the dashboard, which we should talk about in a minute too, but later versions of the dashboard would require more storage than oh, like yeah. zero storage of the core. The dashboard went through so many updates. We yeah, I completely forgot about that. We should talk about that after this. Okay, so yes. Then on August first, two thousand eight, we had the Xbox three hundred and sixty Premium, sixty gigabyte hard drive, three hundred and forty nine ninety nine at launch. I bought this for three hundred dollars. I think I got it a little nice. bit later, and it was my Xbox. It's sitting right next to me, and I love it so much. And there are many like him, but this one is mine. So then on <laughs> June nineteenth. 2010, we had the Xbox 360 S, the first slim model Xbox 360. It was 250 gigabyte hard drive for $299.99. So if I'd have just waited one more year, I could have gotten a way better deal. Okay. On August 3rd, 2010. <laughs> yeah, it's always how it is. That's the way it works. Then this is where the launch of the Xbox 360 Slim with the four gigabyte hard drive for 200 bucks, $199.99. Woo! 
you could have gotten this and then enjoyed some great gaming for about four years until the Xbox One came out. That's great to know. Mm -hmm. And then the last editions of the Xbox 360 was on June 10th, 2013. They launched the Xbox 360 Elite 4 gigabyte version for $199.99. And then the 250 gigabyte version for $299.99. Oh, this is the version that kind of looks like in an original Xbox One a little yeah. bit, right? Mm, yeah. Yeah. And it's like, I think it's like got a black, not shiny finish to it. My friend had mm-hmm. one. It looked really nice. But then the Xbox 360 was e- officially discontinued on April 20th. 2016 and I, I played taps on my trumpet i don't even know how to play trumpet i just had so much emotion in me that i woke up that morning and i played taps i just did it flawlessly <laughs> isn't that amazing but we should that talk amazing we should talk about the dashboard real quick talk about them dashboards that dashboard went through so many changes yeah so many updates um, the so the original dashboard that it launched with was known as like the blades. I don't know if it had like an official name, but what they kept referring to as the blades. And it was like a, it took up the whole screen and you would sort of swipe back and forth between these different colored sections. Um, I can't do it justice just by saying it on the podcast, but if you Google Xbox 360 blades, you'll see what I'm talking about. There would be like a blade for just Xbox Live. There's a blade for music and video. There's a blade for games. And then there was a blade for like system settings and stuff. And they were all different colors and they looked really cool and they moved really smoothly. Um, But there wasn't a whole lot of room for advertisements, which would come much later. Oh yeah. Everyone needs some some good old advertisements in their life. Why would we do something um, if we're not going to have advertisements in it? Yeah, that's the version that it launched with, and uh, and it would pop up when you press the the Xbox button. A thing would come in from the side instead of in the center, like it does now. It like comes in from the side, and would be sort of like allow you to to sort of mess with some stuff um, in game, which was kind of cool. Um, in two thousand eight, they launched the new Xbox Experience. I think that's what it's called, or Next Xbox Experience. Which had yeah, a different new Xbox experience, yeah. New right. Xbox experience. It had a different. Uh, it was totally different, and it had these little cards that would kind of fly by on the screen, like they would sort of come out towards the screen. Um, again, I can't do it justice just by talking about it. Um, but it was like redesigned in a much different way. It was much more um, centered around your your avatar. Uh, I, actually, I think it came out. I think the avatars came out with this with the new Xbox experience. Um, and it would like, so you would like make a little dude that looks like you similar to the Mies in, uh, on the Wii where you would oh, make a yeah. dude who kind of looks like you and, um, you could like buy them shirts and stuff like that, which was also, cool. you could unlock clothes for your avatar, yeah, which was, that was the thing you could get with, with achievements. That's right. Yeah. You could unlock like some games would be like you unlocked a shirt. I unlocked a pork chop shirt in Minecraft and a creeper head I would wear on my head. I wow. played a lot. I, I, I uh, 100% achievements, the original Xbox 360 Minecraft. Nice. Yeah, I was really, I was so into it. It was so much fun. I actually did a thing where I made all these contraptions to get the achievements, which was actually really fun doing. I don't know why. It was just really fun. How many times can I say it was fun? It was great. Okay. <laughs> also, another thing we should talk about too, I don't know if you're finished or not yet, but this is also when we finally saw apps like Netflix and HBO and other oh, yeah. video players, I guess you could say online video streaming services show up. Like I had HBO now and no, HBO go and I had HBO go. Netflix and I had Amazon prime on my 360 at the end of its life cycle. And boy, oh boy, was that just the best you go home, turn yeah. your Xbox on. You're like, I don't know what I'm going to do. Am I going to play games? Am I going to watch movies? What, what's going to happen? The world's my yeah. oyster. I got to shuck it. Let's do this. <laughs> I remember when the the when Netflix announced that they were going to be on the Xbox 360 because that was the first time that any sort of video streaming platform had been made available on a console. So it was like, oh shoot, I won't have to de- get DVDs from Netflix to watch these movies. And their selection at the time was still kind of meh um, before it, before they got a lot better. Um, but it was a really neat like it was just, it, it was like a paradigm shift. You know what I mean? Like it's hard to explain how things were before then. Um, like it's like crazy probably to kids now to think like what you had, there was a time where Netflix wasn't on a thing. Why was it so revolutionary that Netflix was on a console? But it really was. And I remember, um, a couple, 
I don't know if it was years later, but um, it was a little bit later that they became available on the PlayStation 3 and the Wii, except Netflix had an exclusive deal with Microsoft at the time to have their software be installed on the, the console. So the way they got around it was they would ship you a disc for Netflix for your PlayStation or for your Wii. And they would ship it to you for free, and they would say, you don't have to return this, and that's how you would watch Netflix on your PlayStation 3 or your wow. Wii. Wow, so it was like um, a game? Until their, yeah, until their deal was up. Um, and I still really have cool. those discs because I'm holding out hope that one day it's going to be worth something. It probably never will, but... You know what? Um, I think one day it will be worth something, Tyler, and they'll be like, I wonder who saved those discs, and it's like, me! I did, yeah. They're, it was pretty neat. Um, once their deal with Microsoft ran out, then, of course, the PlayStation got Netflix, and we got Netflix. They all got... Um, all of the apps and uh, and the, the the rest is history. But Netflix was definitely the first one, um, and they they really pioneered that, um, which was pretty neat. Yeah. Um, after so much the stuff. new Xbox experience, they had they did some some like cosmetic updates to the new Xbox experience. They kind of rearranged some stuff, but then they did one more major update um, that made it feel more like um, Windows Eight with their tiles system. Ah, uh, yes, I remember um, this. Yeah, so you would like swipe, and, and uh, the original um, Xbox One interface was similar to this too, and you'd kind of swipe between these different screens of tiles, and they could fit a lot more advertisements in there, um, and that's when I started getting kind of fed up with all of the advertisements, because yeah. I remember when Xbox Live first launched on the 360, you could be Xbox Live Silver, which didn't you didn't have to pay a fee for, but you also couldn't play games online. You basically just got a gamer tag, and they let you, I don't know, look at things online. Um, or you could be Xbox Live Gold, and you got all the things that came with Xbox Live Gold. But one of the things that came with Xbox Live Gold was no ads on your dashboard. I mean, if you had silver, you oh, had like there was yeah. like one spot on the dashboard where it would like show you a single ad, and you wouldn't have that if you were at, were a gold member. And they threw that out the window once they realized that everybody was going to be a gold member whether they showed ads or not. And then they redesigned the dashboard so they could show more ads. They're like it's advertisement time. We're Microsoft. Yeah, AdBox 360. That's right. Yeah. That was really, I think we covered a lot of it. I'm sure there's something we're missing, but next week we will be talking about the Xbox 360 games. And if we think of something between now and then that we should have mentioned, oh, we yeah. definitely we should jump cover in some accessories on too. That. Oh, yeah. Like, I want to talk about uh, the old the old Wi Fi dongle mm-hmm. that I have. Wi Fi dongle. I love the HD DVD accessory. Oh, my goodness. That's, that's one a of my huge favorites. thing we got to talk about. We'll save that for next episode, then. Yeah. Yeah, we'll say this is the history part one, and then we'll say games in history part two. All right, does that work for you? That works for me. There's so much to cover, and again, we're kind of going into our own modern. Like, this is my first like because I had N64 and stuff, but I never really thought of video games as like my thing mm-hmm. until I got an Xbox 360. That's when it became that's like what a made major, you a gamer. It made me a major part of my identity. Is that mm-hmm. is a system and stuff, and then I had PC games in high school too, but. Then my PC got out of date. Anyway, so it's like, yeah, this is what made me get back into everything. So, yeah. wow. Mike. Yes. What have you been playing? Oh, boy. Do I have three doozies of games to tell you about today? One, I finally beat Red Dead. Yes. All of it. The epilogues right. and everything. Took me Great. one night, because I don't know if I told you or not, it is currently a snowmageddon is what they're calling it in western washington state right now yeah i heard it's just covered in snow it's a lot of snow on the ground i would say right now it's six inches have fallen since uh this afternoon and school's already canceled tomorrow and everything's canceled so i'm just hanging out playing games but i played red dead finish that very heart warming bittersweet story great stuff really fun stuff loved it Mm -hmm. and then uh, a game small game came out called apex legends Mm -hmm. (laughs) Small yeah, game. that's taken the world by storm. I played a couple rounds of that last night. I have probably played more than 20, 30, wow. 40 rounds of it. I had a couple nights where I played it for like six hours straight. And it was Dang. really, yeah, it was probably way more than 40 then. I have won two games. And both times I've won, I have been dying and my friend saved me <laughs> and won the whole thing. <laughs> so it's like, but it's really fun. They've just taken the... The whole uh, the whole battle royale and made it really streamlined, so I don't feel bad jumping in alone. Yeah, and it feels good. The movement it, just feels really smooth. It feels it was someone described it as not because I think PUBG goes for such realism and Fortnite's third person, so I don't include it. Sorry, everybody, but I it feels like you're playing Doom 
or Borderlands, mm-hmm. like a more arcadey version of mm-hmm. a first person shooter. And that's what I like, like fast paced. Like I want to get into a gunfight where I feel like in PUBG, you're running away all the time thinking I'm not kitted out for this. I got to like go back and get more yeah. stuff. So it's way more fun in that way. But you enjoyed it too. Did you like it? Yeah, I played a couple of, couple of rounds last night, just solo in with, you know, with whatever teams they give you. You can't play truly solo in this, I don't think. There's like, it's like teams of three. Yeah, um, there's only three so, on three right now and one yeah. map. You can play by yourself and you don't have to talk to other people because you can ping and their pinging system is awesome. Their like, pinging really system? You really don't have to talk. Oh, it's so good. It's yeah. and Also, did you notice the small details too? Like when your teammate fires their gun, a little thing pops up by their icon so you yeah. see who's shooting and you see where they're at and you can see where they're shooting. And then yeah. also like you can, yeah, you can ping items, you can ping enemies, you can ping locations. It's, it's perfect. And they, I heard the thing on how they tested that out was they all like knew each other, obviously at respawn, the people that made it. And so they mm-hmm. made them all go in separate rooms and they gave everyone a randomized gamer tag and no microphones to like, that's how they figured out how to streamline Oh, that's a great this. idea. Yeah, it's it's really it's a great game and it's free. If you're not playing it, it's free. Just try it out, you know? Yeah, and, and if it's you hate on it, Xbox, just PC, it. PlayStation. Mm-hmm. It's great. It's really everything. fun. The, I wish it had cross play and and or cross progression, but I yeah. hope I'm hoping it gets there. I think it will yeah. get there eventually. But it's so new also, you know. Yeah. I think my favorite thing is you can do like skiing, like in uh, old tribes. Oh yeah! Did you ever do you like, play tribes and do the skiing? I never played tribes, but you mean like when you crouch on a hill and you just slide yeah. down it? Oh, it's so fun! It feels so good, and like not enough games have skiing, like tribe style skiing, and this one does. And it's like, yeah, man, it's really, it's doing what like Fortnite took the idea that PUBG had, which you know you can argue it was not an original idea, or maybe it was, depending, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter. Fortnite took what PUBG was doing, and they. They streamlined it in a way that was nice. They made it a little bit more uh, accessible, and then they added some extra elements like the the building and stuff, which they kind of were taken from their their like ill fated sort of save the world mode, which I think is still happening. But um, and it like it definitely was a battle royale game with this like other system of building bolted on. But I feel like Apex Legends is tra- is taking what PUBG did, this like sort of r- semi realistic um cover based uh like battle royale game a tactical shooter and they're doing it just better like the way the the guns are where the, you know what they are immediately the way the ammo is color coded to the style of gun cuz like it works a similar way in PUBG where like certain guns can only take the certain kind of ammo. And it like, if you will, if you know what that is, it makes sense and it's fine. But the way they color code it in apex legends makes it just make a hundred percent sense immediately. You know, I don't feel like I need to learn these guns and what type of ammo they take. And then the way the, um, the attachments are like sort of colored in a way that like lets you know how good they are basically. And just kind of automatically equip. It's like just streamlines it so well that it, it, gives that depth that PUBG had that Fortnite didn't quite have, at least in the shooting parts of it. PUBG or Fortnite has the the building depth, which is its own beast, which I'm not a huge fan of, but it's its own deal. Um, but PUBG has that tactical shooter like depth. And I think Apex Legends takes what's good about that tactical shooter depth and keeps it and then tosses away the stuff that doesn't actually matter. And I like it feels really good. I've only played two rounds of Apex Legends. I almost won my second round. Oh, um, it's so rad. It was like down to a one guy on my team and one guy on their team, and we just lost a we lost a firefight. Dude, well, but, I have it on PC, so tonight we can we can boot this up oh, together yeah. and play a little bit. I'm excited. I do you have another game by the way you've been playing? Because you've been traveling. I know that. Did you play any games while you were traveling? Uh, I played a little bit of Diablo three on the plane, and I played a little bit of uh, Pokemon Let's Go on the plane. Um, but uh, other than that, I haven't really been playing a whole lot of games this week. Um, but I do need to jump back into Destiny because I got to get my, I got to roll for Jotun this week Dude, still. I haven't told you yet, but I got Le Monarch. Nice. I got really lucky. So Tyler went and traveled and I felt bad. And I was like, well, I'm going to do these like armor. I had like one more weapon frame for the week and I just did it in the forge it was supposed to go to. And I got Le Monarch dropped with it too. <laughs> it was just nice. super dumb luck, which is like half of Destiny's RNG, but whatever. Yeah. I haven't played since then though. I, I took the whole week off from Destiny because I was like, I just want to play other games. And I actually found 
a, a Lunar New Year sale game that my roommate plays called Stellaris. Ooh. And it's like civilization, but there's no turns. It's real time. Like it's going and going as they're going, you're going. And solar systems and the whole galaxy and you're mining and getting resources. But you can like very much. It's very much that strategy game where you start playing it and you blink and three hours have gone by. It's kind of dangerous. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's like a civilization. Yeah. It's really fun, though. And and it was 10 bucks, which is just a steal. And I'm having so much fun with it. So. Stellaris, check it out if you play PC games. And that's nice. That's all for me. That's that's all I got too. All right. As always, you can rate and review and subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher, or we're on Spotify now as well. And I think we're on Google Play. And you can email us at codexhistorypodcast at gmail.com. If we forgot to mention something about the Xbox 360 and you're like, I need them to talk about this, then you can email us there. And you can find Tyler at Sneaker Elf, E L P H on Twitter, and me at Me Coletta on Twitter. And Tyler would you like to say goodbye to the listener in like a, a sassy way maybe today? I, I would like to say goodbye to the listener in like a sassy way. All right. Goodbye then. Just go. Fine. It's fine. Bye. This has been a Potaholics Comedy Network presentation. Potaholics.com.